In this lecture, we're going to look at the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is the theorem that unites differential calculus, study of derivatives, with integral calculus, study of integrals. And the integral calculus is what we're developing this term. And the fact that the integral, the area problem, is in any way related to the derivative may come out as a surprise. But this fundamental theorem is the theorem that tells us that these things are related. In fact, it's going to tell us that differentiation and integration are sort of inverse operations of one another. So let's start with a motivating problem. Does every continuous function have an antiderivative? What do we mean by antiderivative? I just means if I start with a, a function, little f, can I find a function, big F, whose derivative is little f? Notice this is not the question of asking, find the derivative of little f. That's a differential calculus question. That's something we studied last term. This question is a little bit more subtle. It's saying, you have a function, little f. Can you find something whose derivative is that? I mean, just as an example, suppose little f is x. Is there a function whose derivative is x? Sure. 1 half x squared is a function whose derivative is x. So capital F is called the antiderivative of f. And little f is called the derivative of big F, as we talked about in differential calculus. So this question is saying, suppose you start with any function little f. It doesn't have to be just f of x equals x. Any function whatsoever, as long as it's continuous. Does there exist an antiderivative? And it turns out that the answer, it might be surprising, but the answer is yes. It might be surprising because if we ask the question, does every continuous function have a derivative? Well, the answer to that is no. The absolute value function is a function who's continuous but is not differentiable. Okay, so the answer in the, in the case of the question, does every continuous function have a derivative? The answer is no. But here we're asking, does every function, continuous function have an antiderivative? Does there exist a function so that when you differentiate it, you get back to the left? And the answer turns out to be yes. And this is actually the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, what might be surprising about this is, although the answer is affirmative, Yes, every little f has a continuous function, little f has an antiderivative. Sometimes we might just not be able to find them. Well, find them in, in a certain sense. So here's the next problem. Well, if every function does have an antiderivative, every continuous function, then what is the antiderivative of this? And now we'll just assume uh, we're looking on the positive x values, for example. So it's continuous for x bigger than 0. Um, in fact, this thing is going to be continuous at 0 if we define it to be 1 at 0 because the limit of sine x over x is 1 at 0. So we could define this to be 1 at 0 and then have it continuous on the whole real line. But we don't necessarily need to go that far right now. Um, I'm just going to look at any interval on which this is continuous on and I'm going to ask the question, what's the antiderivative of it? It has to exist. So what is it? Turns out, even though the antiderivative of this exists, we cannot express it. We can't express the antiderivative in terms of elementary functions. What are elementary functions? They're functions that we're used to dealing with polynomials, uh, rational functions, uh, root functions, trigonometric. Uh, logarithms, exponentials, they're the usual functions we're used to dealing with. Those are the elementary functions. And it turns out that the antiderivative of this, even though it exists, we cannot write it down in terms of elementary functions. We have to write it down in another way. What's that other way? Well, it turns out we can write it down using integrals. And that's what this, sec this first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is telling us. So let's have a look at that now. If f is a continuous function on a, b, then we define this function g in terms of an integral. It's the integral from a to x of f of t dt. And it turns out that this function g has a nice property. Its derivative is f. Okay, so it, this definition of g might look a little bit confusing, so let's just get an idea for what this is saying. So here's f. 
this is a blue curve, and I'm only going to restrict our attention to this interval from A to B. We could look at F over the whole real line, but I'm just going to focus my attention on the interval A to B. So there's our function F. What is this function G I've just constructed? Well, what G is, is I pick any x value, and I look at the integral from A to x of F. So the integral is represented by this shaded region here. So down here I've just collected some of the information. x, I've just moved the slider to 1.54. The function value f is 0.77. I've just picked a, a generic function here, so you don't have to worry too much about these numbers in, in terms of what they are. Um, we're just going to look at comparisons between the numbers over here and the numbers on the right-hand side in a second. That's all the, the only reason I want them there. What I do now is I construct the integral from a to that particular fixed x value. That integral comes out with a number. That number changes depending on where I slide x to. So this integral is a function of x. As x changes, the value of the integral changes. So there's a function lurking here. The function which is the integral represented by that blue region. So what I've plotted on the right hand side is the value of the integral for every x value. So I work out the integral from a to x here, I get the value of 0.71, I go over here and I plot at the x value 1.92, because that's the x value I'm at, I plot a point of height 0.71, the value of the integral. And I do that for every x value. An x value of 4.32, work out the integral, plot the point that has that x value and the y value being the value of the integral. And in that way, I use the integral to construct a new function. I like to think of this function as like the area so far function. Maybe I shouldn't say area, maybe I should say signed area so far. Because when I look at an x value here, I'm looking at the signed area of these two regions. The area of the stuff above minus the area of the stuff below. The integral, in other words. So this function on the right is just accumulating the values of the signed areas as I move along. And so that's how I'm constructing this function g. It's just the area so far function. The area so far. So I get this new function g. And here's the interesting thing. Watch what happens now when I plot a tangent line to this function g at a point. So I plotted the tangent line, and here I've written down the slope. Do you notice anything interesting about the number that appears as the slope versus the numbers over here? The slope of the tangent line seems to be equal to the function value f at x. Okay, maybe it's a coincidence, so let's drag the number around. It doesn't look to be much of a coincidence anymore. Every time I drag x, the function value changes. So does the slope over here, and they seem to be equal to each other. So I've constructed this function, the area so far function, or this integral of f, over here. I work out its derivative, and I seem to get back to the original function. So I start with f, I take its integral, construct this new function, now I take the derivative, and I seem to come back to f. That's what the fundamental theorem of calculus part one is telling us. It tells us if we do this process of take a function, form a new function using the integral, or the area so far, that new function has the property that when you differentiate it, you get back to the original function. And so that's what this is saying saying we're now back to the original function when we differentiate that new function, g. So let's write down what this says. What this theorem says. So it says start with defining this function, g, which is the signed area under f from A to B. So let's just get a picture here. I've got my function f from A to B. I pick a value x, any value x between A and B, and I work out the integral of that, and that's what I'm calling g. So this is equal to the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Now, uh, some students are bothered by the fact that 
even though function, the function looks like it's a function of the variable x, why are we using t in here? Well, it's, it's, um, it's not as deep as you might think. The, the only reason we're switching to t here is because I want to use x again. I want to use x as my upper limit of integration because that's the variable I want to use for my function g. If you think about an integral, let's just look at an example here, the integral from 1 to 2 of x dx, that's just some number. Right? It's the area under the function uh, y equals x from 1 to 2. Does that number change if I switch the variable name? No, it doesn't. If I'm looking at from 1 to 2, there's the piece of the function I'm looking at. All the, either of these integrals represents is just this area. They're the same value. What we call this variable of integration a dummy variable. It doesn't really matter what variable name I use for it. It's going to get integrated away anyway because you're left with a number in the end. That variable goes away. It's a placeholder, dummy variable. So the fact that I've switched it to t here doesn't make any difference whatsoever. The only reason I did it was because I wanted to use x again as the upper limit of integration so that my ultimate, my n function g is a function of x. So I just wanted to use x for my function g. So I just had to replace the, the variable of integration with another variable, the dummy variable. It doesn't matter. Okay, so we've got our function g defined in this way. Now, g has this very special property. g has the special property that when you differentiate it, you get back to the function f. You start with f, you construct this new function, which is the area so far function, or the signed area so far, or the integral. Once you've got this new function, which is a function of x, as you change x, as you change the upper limit of integration, the values that come out of the integral change, so g is a, 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 a real function of x in this case. And it has a special property that when you differentiate it, you get back to f. So in other words, g is a differentiable function. You've constructed this function g, and it's differentiable. And its derivative is f. OK, so whenever we state a theorem, um, usually the first thing one wants to do is try to see why it's true. In other words, prove it. Oftentimes, we don't prove a lot of the theorems in this course. The proofs of a lot of these major theorems in this course, we leave to Math 242, our real analysis course, where you go through and you put all of these theorems in a rigorous setting and then you prove them. But I do want to mention how you would go about proving this theorem, because I think that's important to understand. It's not just coming out of thin air. There's, there's a way you can actually think about why this should be true. So the way you would prove it is you'd have to go back to the definition of a derivative. So I want to differentiate g. And by definition, this is the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient, g of difference quotient, g of x plus h minus g of x all over h, and the limit as h goes to 0. So that's the definition of derivative. So this is the thing we focused on a lot in the last semester's course. So by the definition of derivative, that's what g prime is. Now we can go ahead and use what g actually is in terms of an integral. So this would be the integral from a to x plus h, f of t dt, minus the integral from a to x of f of t dt, all over h. Okay, now you, know, you might be thinking, well, this is starting to get pretty complicated. And it's actually not so bad because even though there looks like there's two integrals here, let's just recall something. We have some properties of integrals that we can utilize now. I'm only just going to write down the integral sign. This is our little thought bubble, so this is what's going on in the back of our heads. And I'm just going to try to focus your attention on what's important. So this is an integral from a to x plus h, and then we're subtracting off the integral from a to x. I can always switch the limits of integration at the cost of putting a negative sign out front. Or another way to look at this is I could take that negative sign out front of that second integral, and I can absorb it into the integral by switching the limits of integration. So this becomes then 
the integral from a to x plus h plus the integral from x to a. And now I look at it this way. Maybe if I switch the order, that might make it a little bit more clear as well. So I'm looking at the integral from x to a plus the integral from a to x plus h. Now it might be a little more clear with what we're going to do. We start at x, we integrate to a, and then we go from a out to x plus h. So we're transitioning through a. We have a property that tells us we can combine the sum of these two integrals into just one integral. Starting at x and going all the way to x plus h. So that's our thought bubble which tells us we can always reduce that integral up top into just a single integral, the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt, and then we've got this one over h out front. And now we're pretty much done, because let's think about what this integral represents. This integral, you start at x, you go out to x plus h. We're imagining h is really small, because we're thinking of h going to zero. So the function doesn't do very much on that inter interval, maybe something like this. The integral represents this area here. If h is really small, so this is really thin, then this, this function doesn't change very much at all. It's roughly constant, it's roughly just the value of f of x if h is really, really small. So the height of this, what could be approximated by a rectangle, should be f of x. The base is h. So the area of this thing is approximately f of x times h. So we're taking the integral, which is roughly f of x times h, we're multiplying by 1 over h, so this is roughly f of x. We're taking the limit as h goes to 0, so this thing should ultimately become f of x. It's about a rectangle of height f of x times h, and then we divide by h, so we get rid of the h, and we're just left with f of x. Now this was a bit hand wavy, this last part, and that needs to be tightened up a little bit, and, and uh, the textbook tightens it up a little bit, and this, these are the kinds of things that we, we would tighten up in a, book, a class like Math 242. But this is the general idea of how the derivative of g should be equal to f. And I think uh, just giving you this sort of idea as to why the theorem is true is, is much more powerful than uh, just leaving it alone. I, I want you to know where these things are coming from. They're not coming out of thin air. Coming straight from the definition of the derivative. So a little box to indicate that it's our end of our proof. And so there is the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So let's do some examples where we get some practice with it.